Uh, it's great to be with you. As Sifa said, my name is Mark. Many of you probably don't recognize me. I am a second service person. So I think you guys are amazing that you can come and be here uh, this early every week. Um, my wife, she isn't even here yet. She'll come for the second service. So uh, we arrived in Nairobi in September and got plugged into a life group down in Karen really quickly. Uh, that's something important for us as we get into a church to get connected into the life of the church. And 15 years ago in the U.S., uh, we moved and went to a church. We didn't really like it, but that was the church that we felt we needed to be in for the time. And I just I couldn't make friends, so I uh, couldn't meet people really hard, so I decided, let me go to the men's retreat. Now, I had no idea. It's a long time ago. I was in my 30s at the time. Yes, long time ago. And I get to the retreat and find out that I was pretty much the baby there. So lots of guys in their 60s and 70s, but I thought, oh, this is great. And our first small group discussion, the, the guy who was leading the retreat had given some questions. And if I can be honest, the questions were not that awesome. So as a group, we were sitting around all staring at each other, not really knowing what to do. And I was the new guy, but I'm fine with talking. So I said, all right, guys. What's your purpose in life? Some of them looked at me like, what kind of question is that? But then one older guy, I, I'm sure he thought, I've got the answer. He said, well, I'm retired, so I'm just living my life, waiting till I die so I can be with Jesus. And other guys looked at him like, yeah, being with Jesus, that's a good thing. And I looked at him in, a, in his face and I said, what a waste. And the people, what? You're just sitting around waiting until you die? Think about how many young people are in this church, how many people you could be mentoring, the kind of work that you could be doing in building God's kingdom. And you're just waiting until you die. I don't think I ever talked to the guy again. Uh, it was a big church, so I wasn't trying to avoid him, but... He probably doesn't remember it, but I've never forgotten. And it really challenges me, like, what am I living for? Am I living for something more than simply, well, I'm saved and so I get to be with God when I die? Or is there something more? So if you've been coming the last few weeks, we've been doing this series, This is the Good News. This is the good news. And we've been talking about the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the amazing message that God, the God who created you and me, loves us so much that he wanted a relationship with us. But because of our sin, that relationship was broken. But when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he died, buried, resurrected, and we celebrated that last week with Easter. That sacrifice of Jesus, he paid the penalty for our sins so we can have a relationship with him. We have been set free, set free from the law, set free from sin. We have been set free to love and serve and worship the Lord. So we've been talking about that, and, and one of the things, as we've been talking, about, been talking about grace a lot the last few weeks, one of the other things that we've been talking about is works, the idea that we want to do good works. We want to serve the Lord. We've been called to do good things. And last week, Monisi talked about dead works, these works that aren't coming out of a life of faith and um, so, okay, those are dead works. Well, well, what are alive works or good works? What is it that we're supposed to do, and why are we supposed to be doing it? Because, again, like this guy at church, well, he was right. He was saved. And when he died, he was going to be in the presence of the Father. But is there something more to that? 
This idea of how we are supposed to live our lives. Well, if we're saved by grace, not saved by our works, but if we're saved by grace, why should we work? Why should we be doing good things? Why should we be loving and serving and giving and being a part of building God's kingdom here at One Tribe or or wherever we're at? So this guy really missed the idea that there's a reason we're saved. We're not just saved for eternity, but we're saved for now to be involved in what God is doing. So again, if these works, if they don't make a difference in our salvation, where we are going to spend eternity, then what difference do they make? Now, I've, I've heard and I was talking with a friend last week about what good is it to do good works? And she told me and my wife, she said, well, we're building a mansion in heaven. That's what she learned. We're building a mansion in heaven. So every time we do a good work, we get a brick. We get a brick. And those bricks are building for us a mansion in heaven. And how exciting is that? We are going to have this great big house. But is that what we're living for? A big house with a big TV and a big SUV for all eternity. Yes, that's what I've been saved for. Maybe we've been saved for something different. And maybe our good works are doing something different. So what is our motivation? Why should we want to serve the Lord with our lives? And if we do, right, what's the benefit? What is the reward? Spoiler alert, the reward's not a big mansion, okay? But I'll get there. So why are we living this life? What is the purpose? Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians. So if you've got your Bibles turned to 1 Corinthians, you can flip there on your phone Open your Bible. In 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks specifically to this idea of being rewarded. And so we want to talk about that today. So we're in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, and, and maybe you have wondered, again, why am I doing these good things Just to be honest, it's often a lot easier to sit at home and do whatever we want to do. And if we're really honest, even sitting at home playing Candy Crush sometimes is better than getting out, because getting up, going to church, going, helping your neighbor, these kinds of things take work. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. Now, this is a church that Paul had planted sometime before. And Paul is not super happy with them at this moment. Now, we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 15, but before we get there, in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul, he's talking to uh, the church, and he says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are worldly. Why? Because they're fighting, they're jealous. So first, Paul is saying, hey, you need to evaluate your maturity. You're not as mature as you think you are. But then he goes here into verse 5 and says, what after all is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants. He also says, you really need to evaluate who you honor. I spent 10 years in Tanzania, and I know that honoring the pastor is super important. Right? The big man, he is the one who has that direct line to God, and we need to make sure that we are honoring him, serving him, sending him that M pesa every month. What's Paul saying? No, your leaders, your teachers, they're just servants. I, I, I hope you honor 
Mbonisi and the elders and the other leaders here, but if you've gone through that Pomoja class, one of the things you'll learn is that we honor everybody here. You don't have to be a leader. So Paul is saying, hey, you really need to evaluate who you honor. And then he gets here. Well, actually, before that, sorry, back in, in verse 8, Paul's talking about the one who plants, the one who waters, the different people who do different jobs in the church. They will each be rewarded according to their own labor. So Paul says that those who serve, those who work, are going to be rewarded. Sometimes we don't like to talk about being rewarded by God, but hey, it's right here. So let's, let's figure out what that means. And when we come to verses 10 through 15, Paul's going to tell us about that reward. Now, he's not going to tell us exactly what the reward is. I'm going to tell you what I think that is. But let's see what Paul says. Let me read this passage first, and then we'll go through it verse by verse. So 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I, that's Paul, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So in this paragraph here, Paul starts by saying, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation. By the grace God has given me, And again, as we've been going through this series, this is the good news. We've been talking a lot about grace. Grace is, it's a gift that you've been given. You don't deserve it. (laughs) But God has chosen to give it anyways. That's grace. Now, one of the things that Paul does talk about in 1 Corinthians is what we call spiritual gifts. Really, those are grace gifts. Gifts that God has chosen to give us because He is good and He loves us. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul isn't saying, hey, folks, I built this church, so you guys better do what I tell you. No, he's saying, hey, God gave me the grace to plant this church. So I don't know what grace is, what spiritual gifts God has given you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have received a spiritual gift. I don't know what that is, but God wants you to be a part of serving and building his church. Now, when he says that he laid that foundation, again, did it by the grace of God. The grace that saves us is the same grace that empowers us to serve And what is that foundation? Verse 11, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if we're honest, there's a lot of churches out there who talk about Jesus Christ, but their foundation isn't necessarily Jesus Christ. What does it mean when Paul says the foundation is Jesus Christ? Well, if you turn back to the previous chapters... In chapter 1, verse 23, what does he say? Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. A few verses later, chapter 2, verse 2, says, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Remember last weekend when we celebrated the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it wasn't just because it's on our calendar. It's because something happened in the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension. That's when when Jesus went up to be with the Father. Something happened that changed the world, and it changed our lives. So when Paul says that 
The church in Corinth was built on the foundation of Jesus. He means it's built on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one who, was, <laughs> who lived a, a sinless life but was crucified, buried, resurrected. He rose from the dead and he ascended. That's the foundation that Paul was building, and that is the foundation that we need to build our life and our works on. So when we are working, let's ask the question, am I doing this because of the finished work that Jesus Christ did on the cross? And, that, and my service, my work is coming out of my love response to the one who has saved me? Or am I saying, boy, I don't know if God really loves me. I don't know if I'm good enough. So maybe if I do these things, then God's going to say, hmm, yeah, that's good enough. I'll let you in. Paul is saying no. As we're serving, as we're working, as we're working, let's make sure we're building it on the foundation of the gospel. Okay? And says back um, again up in verse 10, right? I laid the foundation. Someone else is building on it. What Paul's talking about here is there's some other teachers who have come in and they're teaching different things than what Paul taught. They're teaching things different than the gospel. I am so grateful that there are many faithful men and women preaching the gospel here in Nairobi, online. What a blessing that we can hear God's word. (laughs) We just need to pull out our phone and we can hear a great sermon. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of people out there who are not preaching on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be careful that we are not listening to someone else Somebody that someone else who is building on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and then doing something different with it. And then we here it says at the end of verse 10, this is the command for us. Each one should build with care. Okay, that's maybe not the most exciting verse you've ever, oh, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna build with care. But this is so important. So important. What Paul is saying is, as you live your lives, as you serve Christ, make sure you're building with care. Make sure you're serving the right way. You're you're working the right way. You're giving the right way. You're loving the right way. Again, last week we talked about these dead works. Well, there's something different here. And we're, we're going to see that here in verse 12. Paul says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. Now, Paul's not talking about six different things here, gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw. Paul's talking about two different things here, okay? There are some things that are going to burn up, and there's some things that aren't going to burn up. Fire, when you put that gold, the silver, the costly stones in the fire, it's going to survive. Wood, hay, straw, (laughs) what's the fire going to do to it? It's going to burn. It's going to burn, right? So what Paul is saying is, as you build on that foundation of the gospel, you've got a chance to to build with these materials that are going to last or build with materials that are going to burn, right? Their work will be shown for what it is. So the works that we do are going to be tested. Now, I'm a a lecturer at a university, and we just finished our classes last week, so my students are all very nervous because the examinations are coming. We don't like tests. They scare us. But that's okay. We have the answer key. God has told us what's going to happen here. So again, it says then that that our work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. And probably in your Bible, the word day is capitalized. Not every Bible, but in a lot of them, the word day is capitalized. Oh, look at that. 
What does that mean? It's not just talking about any day. This is the day. The day when all believers will be judged. This is called the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe you've heard it called the Bema. That's what it is in Greek. But this is the time when when Christ is going to judge his followers, his believers, for the works that they have done. So this is not a judgment to say, hey, are you in the kingdom or are you out of the kingdom? This is the day when Christ says, my child, my friend, how did you live your life? How did you live your life? And so this is the day that we need to be ready for in terms of the works that we do. Okay, so this is not a punishment Is there more good or more bad? Again, many of us think that if our good works outweigh our sin or our bad works, if this is the good, if if the scale is this way, then we made it. Friends, that's not the gospel. That's Islam. That's Islam. That you hope that... At the end, your good works will outweigh your bad works. Friends, your good works are never going to be enough to pay the penalty for your sin. You can't do that. Why? Because we are sinful people, and God is far holier than we could imagine. That's why we needed Jesus Christ. That's the gospel that we've been talking about these past weeks. So again, this is not a question of are you in or are you out? It's how did you live your life? So we see in in verse um, uh, 14 then, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If what you've built survives, you will receive a reward. Now, what's the reward? Well, I've already read this passage Paul doesn't tell us what the reward is, okay? We'll get there, hopefully, we'll we'll get there in a moment. But if we've built the right way with gold, silver, costly stones, those works that we've done, that good work, as opposed to the dead works that Monisi talked about, those good works, those living works are going to survive and we will be rewarded because of that. But, verse 15, if it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss. It's possible, friends, that some of us are going through life working really hard, trying to do good things so that God will love us, so that God will accept us. Again, that's not the gospel message. Those are dead works, working out of fear or obligation, Monisi talked about last week. The idea, we're trying to build and do all this stuff. We're getting ourselves a reward, the biggest bag of money ever. Then somebody comes in and drops in a match, and it all gets burned up. That's what Paul's saying. Those works that are built with wood, hay, and straw, works that aren't based on the finished work of Jesus Christ, works that are trying to build our own, our own kingdom, works that are done out of fear, whatever that is, those works are not going to last. But when we're serving because We're saying, God, you've saved me and you love me. You've changed my life. You've empowered me through your Holy Spirit. Now I am going to serve you in response to what you've done for me. Those are the works that are going to survive. Now, it's important for us to notice in these verses that what is being burned is the worker being burned. No. These are the works. These are the works. So when it says here that 
that if it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. If our works have been shown to be worthless, we still have eternity with God. And that's good news. Now, I'm not encouraging you, hey, so you don't need to work, okay? But what I'm saying is, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Am I working hard enough? Are my works good enough? Because at the end of the day, if you know Christ, your eternity is sure in Him. You don't need to be afraid, okay? You will still be saved. Now, anyone here from a Catholic, a Roman Catholic background? There's probably some, okay? Have you heard of purgatory before? Yeah? What does purgatory, what, what is purgatory? Purgatory is the idea that, well, some of us, after we've died, we're, we're not quite pure enough. We might, still, we might have some sin we haven't confessed. There's something wrong. We can't yet enter into heaven, so we need to be purified. We need to pass through the flames. You see that here in verse 15? Okay. It's actually not here in verse 15. But according to the Catholic Church, that is a doctrine. Now, if you think that maybe after you die, you might not be good enough, well, let me just tell you, you're not good enough. But Jesus is. So you don't need to be afraid of purgatory, that you have to pass through some purification process. Jesus did that on the cross with his shed blood. So just so you know, we here, we do not believe in purgatory, that there has to be a time of testing, because if, if there was, we would fail it. Jesus is the only one who can pass the test. So this is what we see here in this passage. We've got to build our lives on this gospel of grace, not on the gospel of works that we need to work really hard. It would be like somebody giving us the greatest foundation and saying, okay, I spent millions and millions building this foundation so you can build a house. And then we go out and we get mabati or mud or plastic for the walls. Why wouldn't we build what's going to last on that solid foundation of Christ and his gospel? So, friends, our love, our service, our ministry, our giving, our good works, they need to come out of an understanding of who Jesus is and what he has already done for us. That's what Paul's telling us. So where do we go from here? Some of you here are teachers. I'm looking at you, Cephas. Some of us are teachers, whether here in the church, children's ministry, in our homes. We might have other ministries in our life groups. Let's make sure that we are building on this foundation. This passage primarily was given for teachers, so let's not forget that, that we who teach need to make sure that we are teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and not a different message. But now for all of us who know Jesus Christ, if we have trusted in him, what are you basing your life upon? Again, are you working hard so that you will be saved? That's not the gospel. You can be free from the fear that you're not good enough. Because again, Jesus Christ, he is good enough. He is perfect. Or maybe you're thinking, I've been saved. I'm going to heaven, so it doesn't matter how I live. Mm -hmm. That's not the gospel either. Because we have been saved to do good works. Saved to do good works. Our works matter, but they're not going to save us. So let's believe the gospel and believe that His grace is enough. There it is. 
If we work, we're going to get a reward. If we're building with the right materials on that solid foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we get our reward. So what is the reward? That's what we want to know, right? Is it the mansion? Where do we get the idea of us building a mansion in heaven? Where does that come from in the Bible? Anyone know? John 14, yes, John 14. Now, this is the NIV. I'm not using the King James, but if you turn to John 14, chapter 2, you're going to find something different. But in the NIV here, Jesus is telling his disciples, my father's house has many rooms. It has many living places. But the old King James Bible said, my father's house has many rooms mansions. Now, today, when we think of a mansion, we're thinking like the state house, we're thinking something huge, right? In the the time when the King James Bible was written, mansion meant a room, okay? But now we think it's something huge. So we think, great, I'm building a mansion. And again, when I do a good work, I get a brick. And so I can build my mansion, make it even bigger, But there's a problem because people who believe that also think, what happens if you sin? Mm, You got to take a brick back out. You lose it. So this mansion you're building might end up being a hut. Okay, there's another problem with this, though. Look at this. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I... Who's I? That's Jesus. I am going there to prepare a place for you. So, friend, if you are thinking you are building the mansion, that comes from John 14, 2. But in John 14, 2, it's clear that that Jesus is the one who's preparing the place for us in eternity. So, I hope this is good news for you. Now, if you've been building a really big mansion and you're looking forward to it, I'm sorry. It's just not going to be there. But whatever our eternity is, we're going to be with Jesus. So you'll be fine without that mansion you were trying to build. So if our reward isn't some great house in heaven, then what is it? Turn back to 1 Corinthians. Again, Paul is talking about these rewards. And if we go a little further into chapter 4, it says, Paul says in verse 5, Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Praise from God. The creator of the universe is looking forward to the day when he's going to say, well done. Well done. Remember the parable of the talents? Parable of the talents, Jesus tells this story and people work and either, either they, they work, they do the good works based on their relationship with the master or they do the bad works. And what does the master stay, say in the story? Come and share your master's joy. Come and share your master's joy. This is the reward. Christ's joy is our reward. Christ's praise is our reward. On the day. Look at you and say, I've seen the work that you've done. It brings me joy. It brings me joy. but yet we want a house? What's going on in our hearts 
if we would rather have, again, the big house with the big TV and the SUV, if that's what we want more than Jesus saying, well done, you bring me joy. And I'd question if we really know who Jesus is. Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, wanted a relationship with us. So he went to the cross. That should blow our minds that we have a relationship with the one who made us. So friends, if you're looking forward to your mansion, and I get it. Some of us, life now is hard. You don't need a mansion. You don't need a bigger house than your neighbor in heaven. When you stand before the Lord and he says, well done, daughter. Well done, son. How you lived your life, it brought me joy. That's all we need, friends. Now, some of us, we've come in here today, and we don't yet know who Jesus Christ is. We have not trusted him as our Savior. And we've been talking about this day, this day of Christ when he is going to judge our works. You say, well, I don't know what that means for me because I'm not sure yet that I know God. Well, the last several weeks, we have been proclaiming the gospel as clearly as we can. So our invitation to you is, friend, come. Come to Jesus, the one who can set you free from sin, the one who can set you free from the law and dead works and trying to be good enough. Trust him with your life. Trust him with your future. He's worth it, friends. When we finish in just a moment, the worship team's going to come, and after we end, would you come talk to me? Talk to somebody who's up here. If, if you don't yet know Christ, we would love to talk a little more and pray with you if that's something you're interested. Don't go home from here without talking to somebody or settling it. This is the last week. Not that you can't accept Christ next week, but this is the last of six weeks in talking about the gospel. And friends, the most important thing that we want to make sure you understand is that this message is for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've been thinking about while you're sitting here or what you did on your way to church. Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for that sin, and he wants a relationship with you. So friends, what would it look like? What would it look like as a church, as a community here, if we served and loved and did work, not because we were trying to get some favor with God, but simply because we're responding to the God who loved us who saved us, who one day is going to say, well done, your work brought me joy. Let's pray. God, you alone are worthy of our worship. God, you have called us into a relationship with you Yes, for a future, but also for a present. God, help us to live well in the present. God, that we would serve you. That we would love. That we would be a part of building your church. Building your kingdom here in Nairobi, across this country, around the world, Lord. We pray that we would bring you joy. We pray all this 
in the amazing, saving name of Jesus Christ.